好的好，呃，尊敬的奎因大使，呃、uh, ，Distinguished Ambassador Queen, Distinguished Mr. Wei Hokai, Distinguished Experts and Scholars from the United States and China, it's a great pleasure for us to have this opportunity to have the third U.S.-China Agriculture Roundtable Think Tank Dialogue. First of all, on behalf of RDI, CAS, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you present here and also my congratulations to the convening of this event. It's a great pleasure for us to have this opportunity to co-host this event with USHCA and also Chinese Society of Foreign Agricultural Economy, China Society of Forestry, Animal Husbandry, and Fishery Economics, as well as Center of Agriculture and Rural Modernization, RDI, CAS. So we have this great pleasure to have with us heavyweights in this agricultural field. And we have the topic, Rural Development and One Health, this is a very important topic for all of us. So we expect we have fruitful discussions and also we can better communicate and contribute to US-China agricultural cooperation. And now I would like to, first of all, give the floor to our distinguished speaker, Mr. Kenneth Queen, President Emeritus of the World Food Price Foundation, USHCA Strategic Advisor and member, former U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Dr. Wang Lei. On behalf of Governor Bob Holden, the uh, chair of the U.S. Heartland China Association, Ms. Min Fan, the executive director, and their team, I want to say how very pleased we are to be, uh, I want to say how very pleased we are to be uh, working closely with CAF and uh, in organizing these events for the last three years. Um, now, behind me, you see that building is the Dr. Norman Borlaug World Food Prize Hall of Laureates in Des Moines, Iowa from which I'm speaking to you uh, this morning, this evening here in Iowa. And Professor Yun Long Ping is, oh, as the World Food Prize Laureate, is recognized there. But Dr. Wang Lei will remember that it, this is the building in which Vice President Xi Jinping came to speak in 2012, when I had the great honor to greet him and welcome him. And it's the building in which Dr. Wang Lei and I did our very first event, uh, a think tank symposium in June of 2017, when uh, I was president of the World Food Prize. And uh, we had an array of wonderful speakers. That led then to a, a signing a memorandum, an agreement of cooperation. And I came to Beijing and to China to participate in several other CAS events, uh, and each one producing more and more dialogue and understanding between us. In 2020, uh, due to the pandemic, we had a virtual conference in December. And I was a speaker, it was on China's amazing accomplishment of eliminating poverty in which rural development played a very big part. And at the end of my remarks, even though I hadn't planned it, I said, you know, I've retired from the World Food Prize, but now I'm working with the USHCA. Perhaps it would be good for CAS to undertake an agricultural dialogue, a round table, uh, to continue this work. And uh, so Dr. Wang Lei, uh, a member, wonderful member of his staff, Ms. Zhang Liwa, connected with Ms. Min Fan uh, from the USHCA. And we put together the very first Ag Roundtable uh, during 2021. In 2022, 
we had uh, ag dialogue again here in this building behind me, um, which Ambassador Chin Gang came in person. We had Ambassador, former Ambassador Terry Branstead, and we had virtually participating from Beijing, the American Ambassador, Nick Burns. And it was uh, amazing given that uh, our relationship uh, between our two governments had become much more difficult. And that model that we developed between CAS and USHCA has become a very new and interesting uh, way to conduct diplomacy. That by having non-governmental organizations like the USHCA and CAS invite government officials, they are more easily able to come together and speak. And we saw that again just last week in St. Louis when we had an in-person U.S.-China Agricultural Roundtable uh, with uh, Ambassador Branstead, Ambassador Burns, and the Chinese Charge d'Affaires. I wrote an article about this uh, way of conducting this new type of diplomacy, not in capitals, but in more agricultural focused provinces and by having the non-governmental organizations invite government officials the, to come and participate, we're able to have productive dialogues. So out of that first meeting back in 2017, Dr. Wang Lei, uh, this has grown and become a very remarkable way for our two countries to collaborate and to be able to come together and talk about challenges. And one of the challenges that I hope that together we could promote would be for the U.S. and China to rise to the challenge of assisting and uplifting Africa as we face the single greatest challenge humans have ever faced. Can we sustainably produce sufficient nutritious food to feed the nine to 10 billion people who will be on our planet by 2049 when you celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China? So with that challenge and with our wonderful work together, I'm so pleased to say on behalf of the USHCA, this will be a great event. We're so pleased to be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Queen, for your passionate speech. And uh, it's a great memory for us to have the 2017 dialogue and also all the follow-up dialogues and exchanges. So I would like to pay special thanks to Ambassador Queen. You have done so much for the US-China agricultural cooperation and also people-to-people -people exchange, non-governmental exchange. And you also have given us suggestions that we need to further contribute to agricultural cooperation in our two countries and also to help other countries such as Africa, because we have the single biggest challenge to sustainably produce more nutritious food for 9 billion people on our planet. And I really look forward to seeing Ambassador Queen face to face. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Wei Ho Kai, Professor, Director General, RDI, CAS. Thank you very much, moderator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here for the third US-China Agriculture Roundtable Think Tank Dialogue. This is the third year. And we have the topic, rural development and one health, which is very important for all of us. And we're quite interested in this topic. 
as you all know, rural areas are opposed to urban areas. And in China, rural area is also called countryside. For countryside, you can imagine villages and also you can also incorporate county and also township areas into this concept. And uh, for each and every village, there are more than 1,000 people. And in 2020, according to my statistics, China's cities and uh, township have 1.3% of the total land area of China. That is to say the most majority, more than 95% of the land area belongs to countryside in China. Not too long ago, the Chinese government released some paper. In this paper, there are three categories of land areas, urban areas, rural areas, and eco areas. So when we mentioned rural areas and eco areas, these belong to rural China. So rural development has different perspectives politically, economically, socially, ecologically, all these should be developed for the countryside. So rural development is also a very important strategy to stabilize the society for developing countries. And also for the developing countries, we can eliminate the disparity between rural and urban areas. Because you all know in developing countries, the disparity is quite obvious. But in developed countries, the disparity is not so obvious. In 2017, China has the rural revitalization strategy, meaning to modernize rural areas in China and develop rural areas, farmers, and also agriculture. After five years of concerted development and efforts, China's rural development has been doing good, and we have already witnessed some achievements. Rural development has been a, an important topic for all of us in China. And we also have seen some good examples in from 2018 to 2021, the primary industry increased by 4.31, except last year in 2022, the primary industry has witnessed 4.2%. The disposable income in rural China in 2021 increased by 6.5%, up by 1.9% compared with urban areas. And for 2022, I just mentioned the primary industries increased by 4.2%, the disposable income of farmers increased by 4.2%, up by 2.3% compared with urban dwellers. So for these statistics, we can see the rural development. And also One Health is a new concept in China, meaning to optimize the relations between human, animals, nature, and uh, environmental governance. Back in 2015, China had Health China strategy. In 2016, we had 2030 Health China. 
and uh, we have these strategies to have the goal one health as our direction in 2021 the state council also released the modernization of rural development during the 14th five-year plan specifying the health rural china strategy in a process of one health we have already implemented the one health strategy for instance we mentioned that we need to prevent and control animal diseases and also we need to develop the biogas and on the other hand we need to protect wild animals and their natural habitats and to introduce a number of policies including uh, the 10-year closed period along the Yangtze Delta region and we have incorporated that action into the protection uh, measures and we have also helped the local fishermen to reduce their production and these measures aim to see uh, human beings, animals, and environment as a whole for development um, in order to produce this harmonious coexistence between humans and nature. According to the 20th uh, National Party Congress report, one of the important uh, strategies include uh, that China's modernization also means um, the modernized development of the rural areas. And we believe this uh, forum um, with China's rural development and One Health as the topic will further deepen uh, the understanding between the two sides of this topic and to promote theoretical research and economic uh, and uh, exchanges. And we believe that this was also provide the basis for policymaking. So last but not least, I wish a huge success for today's forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wei, for your presentation on the rural development in China and the latest developments of One House and some of the new policies in place, which will pave uh, the way for further exchanges and dialogues in the future. So on behalf of the RDI of CAS, uh, we would like to thank you for your uh, great support and your hard work and our sincere gratitude to Madam Ming and uh, her team of USHCA for successfully organizing and convening uh, today's event and we look forward in the near future we will have more exchanges uh, in person either in china or in the u.s and last on behalf of one of the hosts i want to say thank you to all of you for being here so now uh, let's um, enter the very first segment of today's uh, round table and uh, um, this section will be moderated by Lo Swanson, former vice president of engagement and amateurs professor of sociology at Colorado State University. Mr. Swanson, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Wei and Dr. Wang for your, your comment. 
我是王局长，非常感谢我们的呃魏所长的介绍。那我们接下来的每一位讲者呢，有十五分钟的这个时间。那快结束之前的两分钟的时候呢，我会提醒大家。那我们这个环节呢，有四位。China and the United States. Our first presenter is Dr. Henderson, who is the former, who is the president,、uh, vice president of extension and outreach programs at Iowa State University. So, Dr. Henderson, I will hand、uh, it over to you for your presentation. Good evening, everyone,、uh, and good morning to all those in China.、Uh, my name is Jason Henderson,、um, and the Vice President of Extension and Outreach and, at Iowa State University. And I just want to、um, express、um, many thanks for the invitation today to talk about rural development, and I will talk about it from a U.S. perspective.、Um, and in, at this point, when I think about rural development in the United States, for the longest period of time.、Uh, Rural areas have been viewed as a place for commodity production, whether in agriculture or in other types of goods, where the sole purpose was for low-cost production, high quantities、um, out there for distribution outside of rural communities for consumption to urban centers or globally as well. I think I'm going to argue today that one of the differences about going forward for rural development is that. The times where、uh, U.S. rural communities are focused on producing cheap goods in mass quantities might be a thing of the past for some of those. And looking at different types of production opportunities coming、uh, for rural areas, and thinking about rural communities as a place for value-added activity、um, in many things, not just in terms of manufacturing, but also in service production. So, what's caused this change in my shift of thinking about rural development and rural policy?、Um, first of all, I think there are opportunities and challenges have emerged in rural communities, mainly from two two things. First, it's COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen here in the United States sparked interest in sparsely populated areas or our rural communities.、Uh, with COVID nineteen, there was a lot of Uh, push for、uh, six feet of separation between people,、um, the use of a、uh, mask in many different ways, and what what is happening instead of、uh, people focusing on urban centers and being in close proximity to others, a lot of people started looking at where were there different places where people could work, work remotely、um, in sparsely populated areas, not in large、um, urban centers. Um, where there was just、um, higher incidences of transmission of the COVID-19 virus. At the same time,、uh, in the United States, we're undergoing、uh, demographic shifts.、Uh, right now, we have a couple of demographic groups, which would be millennials,、uh, which tend to be in their、uh, between their 30s and 40s right now. And the next generation emerging, which is called Gen Z,、uh, which they tend to be in their twenties,、um, graduating from college, they have a different consumption、uh, patterns of what we've noticed in terms of older Americans, the baby boomers, which are those、uh, Americans that are nearing retirement, and, and the subsequent generation around their fifties, around the, the Gen X generation. Uh, they've sparked an interest, more interest in quality of the goods that they consume,、um, understanding of where their goods are produced and how they're produced. In contrast to older populations in the United States, which I would stereotype and characterize, had a bigger focus on low price、um, and high quality.、Um, as I put it, and we've talked to many different demographic groups,、um, and was speaking at a rural summit in Iowa today. Um, characterizing in terms of food,、um, for many、uh, decades,、uh, American food production was focused on producing,、uh, making sure that food was cheap and plentiful.、Um, in many ways, today, this millennial generation and then the Gen Z coming up 
Um, they're less worried about the cost and how plentiful it is. They are more worried about quality, nutrients of the food, healthiness of the food, understand how the food was produced, wanting the food to be produced locally, might be different types of requirements of food production, whether it's organic, produced in sustainable ways. These are different shifts in uh, US food production as an example. And these things are changing the market uh, in terms of US food production, how farmers think about producing food, how food companies think about processing food and acquiring food. And also it's changing how retailers sell food and market food to the final um, consumers. Therefore, and the other part of it, um, when I think about it in terms of rural policy, there's also another question that's being asked. Uh, the fundamental question is, is, do jobs follow people or do people follow jobs? And I think this is a traditional question of where do you focus your development strategies? Do you focus it on creating communities that are focused on having uh, jobs available, and which is a different strategy than focusing on people-based strategies? Um, I think traditionally, when you look at some of the research, it says that when people are emerging from college or taking their first job, oftentimes they go to where jobs are available. So I think about the college graduates that are getting ready to graduate from Iowa State University. Um, they might not be as selective um, in terms of the jobs they take as long as they have a job and their first job that's paying them well on that aspect of it. But as people um, age, um, and in my case, um, you start looking for other places to do work, but you're not only in terms of where you can take a job, but also where those locations that have amenities that are focused on for family and, and living. And so I think that's the thing for us going forward is do jobs follow people? Do people follow jobs? And I think one of the things that we have to think about is COVID, this increase in remote work in America is shifting the, the focus from, is it a jobs-based economic development strategy for rural communities to more of a people-based economic development strategy? And what I mean by people-based, that is it more important to have low cost of production for manufacturing activities or for businesses on that aspect of it? Or is it better to have people-based activities that provide high amenities for living? which would be focused on education, healthcare, entertainment, recreational amenities, and just really good places that people wanna to be to live. And these are two different types of strategies of when you're thinking about rural policy development, one focused on the business environment first, and the other one focused upon living, um, the living environment for people. And with a country of in locations, of limited and scarce resources, they have to make some choices on how they're going to develop and foster growth in their local communities and selecting whether they want a jobs-based strategy or a people-based strategy is gonna be important moving forward for rural, rural communities. So what do people seek? Well, in my mind, when people think, think of uh, what they seek, they want education, they want healthcare, they want recreation, in many different ways, those living-based amenities that are in there. They also want infrastructure because they want access and connectedness, whether it's transportation, that traditional infrastructure of allowing people um, to move physically from place to place. But even more important, it's communications infrastructure and primarily broadband. It's a necessary, but in my mind, not a sufficient condition for development. Places that have I think broadband is going to be a requirement, especially for the younger generation, which has grown up with iPhones and iPads and, and many different types of other communications technology. Um, but it's not going to be sufficient um, for all rural communities. It's a necessary condition. If you don't have it, you will not grow. But just because you do have it doesn't mean you will grow. You have to couple it with all these other amenities that you would have from education, healthcare and recreation. And finally, the third thing is, is I think for rural communities, um, we have to think about what's the economic development strategy, whether it's our traditional commodity-based production strategy that we often think about in terms of agriculture, 
from corn and soybeans? Or do we think about it in terms of how do we process commodities and turn that into value-added products? So it's not um, producing just the number two yellow corn um, here in Iowa, but it's how do you turn them into products that might be bio-based types of plastics? It might be fuel for ethanol. It might be regional-based foods um, that we have you know, em emerging out of rural communities. Um, all of these different aspects of it in there, it's not about simply about commodity production and shipping that all across the globe, but it's how do you add value and turn a commodity-based, low-cost production environment into a high-value, high-profit um, niche markets for many um, different rural communities, but also many different consumers, a much different types of commodity production. So um, I think from my standpoint, I think the rural communities um, here in the United States are at a crucial point where they need to step back and think about their rural policy and development strategies. I think they need to think about how COVID and demographics is shifting our consumer base. It's shifting about where people want to live. Um, not so much maybe in urban centers, but they're rethinking about and taking another look at our rural communities that are more sparsely populated. And as long as they have access and connectedness through strong transportation networks and a vibrant communication network and have local education, healthcare, and recreation, these might be communities that people are willing to move to, to consider home, to bring jobs, to bring to be an entrepreneur and start new new businesses um, and new economic opportunities for other others. But we need to think about it in terms of not so much low cost commodity based production, but high value, high profit, entrepreneurial niche based markets for rural communities. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you uh, for allowing me to have this time to talk to you and provide just a few minutes of high level uh, concepts or, or thinking about what I think about for the future of rural development in the U.S. So uh, I want to personally uh, thank Dr. Henderson for his comments. Um, Dr. Henderson and I worked together on creating the Sino-U.S. Alliance for University-Based Agricultural Extension, starting in 2016. Our next speaker is Dr. Gao, um, who is professor and head of the Research Division for Land Economics at the Rural Development Institute of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, so, Dr. Gao, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good evening. My name is Gao Liang Liang. I am a professor and head of the Research Division for Land Economics, RDI CAS. Today, I would like to talk about China's agricultural and rural modernization. The first part is about our achievements. Because this is a comprehensive dialogue and also concept. So I would like to focus on the following aspects. First is China's total grain output and also the per capita share of grain. So on this slide, we could see from 1978 to 2022, the increase of total grain output and also the black line represents per capita, also increasing. For instance, in 1949, we only had grain output of 113.18 billion kilograms. However, you could see in 1949, the per capita share of grain in China was only 
209 kilogram, but in 2018 it rose to the average world level. And second aspect is the significant improvement of agricultural machinery and equipment. On this slide, we can also see the increase of the total power of agricultural tractors. For instance, in 1949, the total power of agricultural tractors was 73,500 73, kilowatts, and there were only 13 combined harvesters. But in 2018, this has been totally different. And the third aspect is the notable improvement of infrastructure. We can also see from this slide, and from the statistics, we can see at present China has built 42.688 million hectares of high standard farmland with high and stable yield. The effective utilization coefficient of farmland irrigation water reaches 0 0.53, and we can irrigate, we can drain in response to the different weather events. And apart from that, we also have the steady increase in meat and milk production, so we can see from this slide that the meat production increased from 45.84 million tons in 1996 to 89.9 million tons in 2021. And milk production rose from 6.2 million tons in 1996 to 36 million tons in 2021. And the fifth aspect is cash crops from insufficient supply to balance of supply and demand. Since the founding of PRC, the area of cash crops has been steadily increased. And in 2018, the national cotton planting area was 3.3 million hectares. The sixth aspect is the increase of farmers' income. According to the statistics of the National Bureau of Statistics, the per capita disposable income and per capita consumption expenditure of farmers were 134 yuan and 116 yuan in 1978, and up to 2,282 yuan and 1,714 yuan in 2000. Especially since the 18th CPC National Congress, that is 2021, farmers' income have continuously grown rapidly. In 2021, the per capita disposable income and per capita consumption expenditure were almost 20,000 yuan. And the seventh aspect is the victory in the fight against poverty. Since 2012, an average of more than 10 million people have been lifted out of poverty each year. By the end of 2020, about 98 0.99 million rural poverty-stricken population had been lifted out of poverty under the current standards. 832 impoverished counties have been removed the label of poverty. That is to say, we have already had a miracle in the human history. So all these above mentioned are, are the achievements of China's agricultural and rural modernization. What about our experience? Well, the first and foremost experience is the strong leadership of the Communist Party of China. For instance, President Xi Jinping attaches great importance to 
agriculture rural areas and farmers. And he said, without the modernization of agriculture, the prosperity of the countryside, the pleasant living, the farmers' living standards, the modernization of China is incomplete and unstable. And each and every year, we have the number one central document over the past 20 years, since 2004. So this has shown that the central government attaches great importance to farmers and rural areas. And also in 2017, in the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, we also had the rural revitalization strategy put forward. And uh, in order to build a strong agricultural country, RDI has, has also been doing a lot of research under the leadership of Professor Wei Hokai. The second experience is the continuous reform and innovation. The first and foremost, reform was the household contract responsibility system. So this happened in 1978 and it has been so influential because the core of this reform is the separation of farmland ownership and management rights. So Farmers are free to decide what to plant. In this way, the agricultural productivity has been increased and the efficiency has been improved. The second reform is the improving of the stability of land property rights because we need to make sure that we have the stability of land property rights so as to have the efficient utilization of the land pieces. So from 1984 to 1998, this was the first round of contracting period. It was 15 years. And the second round was from 1998 to 2028. So this contracting period was extended to 30 years. And the third plenary session of the 17th CPC Central Committee in 2008 said it should be long-term and changed. And the 19th National Congress in 2017, it says that the second round of contracting period expiration should be extended for another 30 years. So you could see that we have been continuously extending the land property rights contracting period so as to have the high efficiency of utilization. The third reform and innovation is the developing of the land circulation market because um, some farmers, even if they have the ownership of the land pieces, they want to go to cities to find a job. And that's why they would like to give out their ownership of the land. So this kind of the balance of the supply and demand of the land pieces leads to the land circulation market. And we could see that in 1996, 2.6% of the land has been circulated. And this figure has always been increasing. And currently, one third of the China's land has been circulated in this market. And the fourth reform and innovation is the comprehensive promotion 
of the reform of separating rural land rights. So before I mentioned the separation of the two rights, the family contract responsibility system and uh, the ownership and contractual management rights. And now we have the separation of the three rights, ownership rights, contract rights, and land management rights. So this has been a new concept. So we have seen um, these different rights of ownership, uh, uh, contract rights, and ma land management rights are uh, separated for better utilization of the land. And the fifth reform is the rural revitalization strategy, which was proposed in 2017 with a name to achieve uh, agricultural and rural modernization. So uh, the target is that um, by 2050, uh, there are a number of targets to build rural areas with thriving business, pleasant living environment, social adequate and civility and effective governance and General Secretary uh, General President Xi also mentioned the revitalization of different parts of the rural areas. And in 2005, um, this whole concept of uh, rural revitalization idea was proposed and with a focus on production development, well of life, and another three aspects. And the new rural revitalization target is about building thriving business, pleasant living environment, well-built rural civility, and effective governance, affluent life. This um, proposes even better targets and planning for rural development. So that's all I have. Thank you for listening. I look forward to more exchanges. Thank you very much, Dr. Gao, for your presentation. Um, I mean, both the elimination of poverty program and the, the modernization of Chinese agriculture are key five-year plan goals that the Chinese are working very hard. And I think certainly in terms of poverty elimination have made extraordinary progress. Our next speaker is Dr. Hales. Dr. Hales is Professor of Rural Sociology and Director of Pennsylvania State University Extension and Associate Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences. Sorry, um, um, at Pennsylvania State University. So <laughs> my interruption, I apologize. Um, Dr. Hales, it's now your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, as uh, Dr. Swanson noted, I am uh, from Pennsylvania State University, but I've uh, worked all over the country, uh, worked all over the United States, working in uh, cooperative extension systems at land grant universities. And two of the uh, states that I've worked in, one is where the headquarters of the Mississippi River, uh, the largest and most important trade route uh, in the history of the United States is located, and that's in Minnesota. And the other is at the bottom uh, of the Mississippi River, where it actually empties out uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, and that's in Mississippi. So my presentation today will look at the impact of development along the Mississippi River, and particularly the role that agriculture has made in those two states, namely in uh, Minnesota and in Mississippi. So given that it starts in the state of Minnesota, I figured we would start there. So uh, this, uh, the, the headwaters of the Mississippi are actually located at a lake called Lake Itasca. So these headwaters, uh, that is literally the, the start of the Mississippi River as it uh, leaves Lake Itasca. And the settlements along the Mississippi River uh, were established by early Native Americans 
that use the river system uh, all the way from Lake Itasca, all the way down to the mouth into the Gulf of Mexico to establish trade routes, industries, and uh, these remained largely uh, undisturbed for thousands of years, uh, at least in Minnesota, until Europeans immigrated to the region in the 1700s. Uh, there are several Native American nations, different tribal communities that have located in Minnesota over the, over the uh, settlement patterns. And these include the Dakota, Lakota, and Ojibwe nations, all three distinct with subgroups in each one. The indigenous nations of Mississippi include the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and Cherokee nations. And much of my work both in Mississippi and in Minnesota were with these groups. Initially, when Europeans made contact, it happened in uh, the lower Mississippi River in uh, Louisiana and, and in Mississippi with French and Spanish explorers in the 1500s. They were drawn, much like the Native Americans, to the fertile soil and the abundant crops, the um, abundant resources along the Mississippi River system. From there, the settlement patterns went north up the Mississippi River and east from the early European colonies uh, to effectively dominate or drive out many of the Native American nations. They were uh, displaced, driven out, or in some cases, completely wiped out. But there are still settlements, there's still uh, groups of Native Americans living in both Minnesota and in Mississippi. In Minnesota, the European patterns were largely agricultural based, uh, but they came, became diversified over time. These uh, early settlers of Minnesota were largely white and were largely Northern European. Because uh, Minnesota is near Canada, it's very cold. And uh, so the white Northern Europeans uh, came to Minnesota for its familiar climate. Uh, there are three temperate growing zones in uh, Minnesota. Additionally, uh, these groups valued a Western style education. And so uh, education went out across uh, the, the, the state or the, the territory at the time when it was first settled, uh, enabling uh, further development and growth. Uh, some of the agriculture uh, that was uh, that has grown there is certainly timber, particularly in the northern part of Minnesota, as well as typical commodity crop, crops, sugar beets, corn, soybean, wheat, and others. As uh, time went on, uh, and as more and more people uh, began to settle uh, Minnesota, the shift of agriculture uh, to other forms of economies, other economies such as manufacturing, uh, finance, professional, technical, trade, management, construction, all of these began to overtake the role of agriculture. And as you can see, uh, agriculture only makes up about 2% of the gross domestic, domestic product in Minnesota. And that was back in 2021. It's still pretty consistent today. But as a result, um, the utilization of the region for strictly agriculture has been largely uh, changed. Northern Minnesota still has large uh, sections of forest uh, where uh, the forest products associations are, are heavily dominant. But in central and southern um, Minnesota, there is a, a large section still uh, in, in agriculture but uh, the, the state has diversified significantly, increasing the capacity of its citizens to recognize it, other opportunities, and therefore it continues to grow and develop. At the other end of the Mississippi River, um, the Mississippi uh, Delta region, Mississippi as a whole, the state, was first settled, as I indicated uh, earlier, it was uh, agriculturally based, and it was settled um, first European contact was in the 1540s. And it continues to have a, a legacy of, of uh, slavery and plantation economies throughout Mississippi, where the landowners were largely white European uh, who utilized uh, slave labor and, and then later uh, indentured servitude and other uh, forms of sharecropping to 
maintain uh, the agricultural way of life. Education was and continues to be largely Western education valued for whites and elites, but there are in many places two educational systems, a public and a private system, where uh, whites in many parts, particularly in the Mississippi Delta region, which I'm gonna be specifically uh, talking about, uh, go to private schools and uh, non-whites go to public funded high schools. Um, educational opportunities in the region have largely been shaped by agriculture. And because of uh, challenges to economics, challenges to education, uh, they are uh, predominantly low-skilled employment opportunities in manufacturing outside of agriculture. Um, and this Delta region, and I'll show you a map of it shortly, um, it uh, is still largely agriculturally based. So the Mississippi Delta occupies the uh, northwest 18 counties of the Mississippi Delta, uh, of, of Mississippi. So this Delta region is an alluvial plain that is largely defined by its rural character. The majority of those counties, aside from one uh, metropolitan area of Memphis, is largely rural. It's also many, most of those counties are actually declining in population. Its people, as I noted earlier, are historically impoverished, lower educated, and are uh, uh, reliant upon the agriculture and, and low skilled manufacturing that exists there. Uh, the Delta, however, is tied to its rich soil. Um, it was not actually settled until the 1890s because as an alluvial plain, um, it was constantly flooding. And only when levees were built to contain the lower Mississippi River was a defined channel created and therefore uh, the soil uh, be able to uh, be utilized for agricultural purposes. However, this historical legacy of the plantation economy still continues to exist. As a result, um, life in the Mississippi Delta is characterized by declining population in the majority of those Delta communities, low educational attainment, racial divides where there still are largely white and non-white uh, communities living jointly but living separate lives, and pervasive poverty, as well as few economic opportunities. The Mississippi Delta is, as I noted, largely agriculturally based, and it's dominated by commodity crops such as soybeans, corn, cotton, sweet potatoes, rice, and by aquaculture, namely catfish. It is these uh, very crops or very, uh, yeah, crops and, and aquaculture that uh, keep those, uh, the, the land largely in the, the traditional landowners. So employment by sector of the Mississippi Delta or of Mississippi as a whole is only 5% agriculture, but in the Mississippi Delta, it is significantly higher than that. So as we look at the data comparing Mississippi and Minnesota, you can see that in 2022, uh, the uh, annual GDP of, of uh, Mississippi was uh, 100 and, well, it was 138 uh, million. Uh, actually, I believe that's uh, 138 billion. And um, the uh, GDP of uh, Minnesota was 466 billion. Um, additionally, GDP per capita was $43,000 and in Mississippi, whereas uh, almost double that in Minnesota. Unemployment rates uh, significantly higher in Mississippi, as well as uh, their overall risk of poverty is over double, is more than double than uh, their counterparts in Mississippi. And uh, that is still with less than half the, or nearly half the population. So there are higher concentrations of poverty. Uh, there are lower economic opportunities in Mississippi. So it presents an interesting case, me having worked in both states where uh, the role of cooperative extension is to translate science into practice, uh, create opportunities in agriculture, and uh, 
in uh, youth development and family development, as well as community and economic development. However, some of the realities that are, that are faced as we work in community-based systems is that we're challenged to work within the community context, specifically the political, social, cultural, and economic realities, and all of the impacts that their collective histories have. So as a result, success looks very differently in every community. What this means though, in order for us to do the work in these communities is that we have to work with and our work has to come from the community versus it being, with it being an asset-based approach versus to or for the community, which is a deficit-based approach and largely relies on technical assistance. Uh, the reality is that doing work in both Minnesota and Mississippi causes, or it, it, it's challenging work, particularly from the extension perspective. But uh, two very distinct futures exist for Minnesota and in Mississippi, should these trends not uh, change. Minnesota will continue to grow economically as it diversifies its economy further, promotes educational opportunities for all, tackles social problems affecting rural, suburban, and urban communities, and addresses social economic uh, conditions that exacerbate poverty. Um, Mississippi, the Delta region in particular, will continue to struggle with persistent low educational attainment, poverty, unemployment, and underemployment, declining trade, and fewer economic development opportunities. And these trends are, trends are unlikely to change as it fails to follow a similar track, despite billions of dollars poured into the region. I want to thank you for the time that I had to, to uh, uh, speak with you today, and I look forward to our questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hales. Um, what Dr. Hales presented uh, it was also in Dr. Gao's presentation in that the Ch China and the U.S. have uneven economic and social development within their borders. Our next speaker is Dr. Zhu, who is an associate professor and assistant dean of the College of International Development and Global, Global Agriculture at Chinese Agriculture University. So Dr. Zhu, um, it is your turn next. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the moderator. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank CAS and also the U.S. Heartland China Association for giving me this opportunity to share and discuss with our distinguished uh, panelists here. I think this dialogue is very important, especially in the context uh, of the ever-increasing geopolitical tensions. Uh, so, uh, I would like to talk about China's new rural construction. So, first of all, uh, let me share my screen with you. Uh, okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, before I go into the uh, the topics. I, I want to give it some historical uh, perspectives because China, you, uh, as you all know, that China is a big rural economy uh, in the past and also uh, also at present. Because now, um, although China's agricultural GDP has dropped under ten percent, uh, but as mentioned by Dr. Wei, China is still uh, largely defined by its uh, rural areas and its the number of its uh, rural people. So we are still having an ongoing urbanization process. So it means that still we have uh, more than 30% of people uh, living in the rural areas. And, and uh, so I want to touch upon the, the, uh, the 100 years uh, process of China's modernization. So in this process, um, uh, the, the, the rural, uh, rural modernization is always at heart of uh, at at the heart of China's overall modernization process. So I want to show you this uh, this trend. So I want to talk about this one hundred years. 
So uh, as you all know, that China has been entered into the modern times since uh, 1840s, but it's in the uh, it's in the early years of the 1900s, the, the 20th century. China has uh, seen various of uh, rural re uh, re reconstruction movements. Um, that's in the early. Uh, uh, early 20th century. And then in 1921, we have this uh, CPC, Chinese Communist Party, and it has led various of uh, rural uh, revolutions. So, and and then continuing to the 1949, when the, the, the People's Republic of China was established, uh, it continues uh, to, you know, revolutionize China's uh, rural economy. So, so, so largely, um, Largely, what it has done is to, you know, uh, is to take the lands. Uh, Professor Xu, you form. need to move your slide. Your slide is not moving. Uh, so now it's it's not moving. Can no, we only see, see the first page of your slide? Oh, uh, which one? Can you see the years? Yeah. No, we only see the first slide. Oh. You need to move the slide forward. Uh, click, click slide two. Uh, yeah, I clicked, but it's no, 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 no. no. Oh, still on the first page. Uh, still on the first page. Yeah. Oh, let me try cursing. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Now change. Not changed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is it okay? Right now, yeah. on slide three. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can see the years, right? The, the arrows. Uh, okay. So largely, it's about you know the the take the land from the landlords and then redistribute it among the peasants, those those who 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 didn't have lands. So that's a revolution uh, process. So it's uh, you know it's it's reshaping the rural China by you know revolutionary approaches. And then we come into this uh, this era, new era of reform and opening up. 1978, namely, China started uh, started to 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 open up to the outside world, and then it also started very of uh, rural reforms and agricultural reforms to de develop to the rural China. So um, the approach has changed uh, a lot. It's uh, this approach has been 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 in the framework of the modernization, the modernist uh, approaches. However, in China we have this kind of uh, urban rural, you know, this kind of uh, dichotomy uh, of economy uh, system. So that means in this early stages, since the uh, early stage of China's reform and opening up era, the to develop the rural uh, China is is for the purpose of uh, urbanization and for industrialization. So that means the the, the developing the rural China to accumulate uh, material uh, forces to to provide labor force for for urbanization. So. Then we come into this new century, 21st century. It has uh, there has been a shift in this development paradigm. So that's what we call the new era. Because in this new era, uh, the cities started to to reversely feed the uh, the rural, and the uh, ur urbanization started to you know give back to the rural development uh, in a in a real sense. So that's why in this most recent 10 years, we have seen this China's fight against extreme poverty and China's national strategy about rural revitalization. So this kind of uh, uh, development era, and now we are in this new development era. So what I want to briefly touch upon is this uh, new, in this new development era where the uh, where the rural China has been uh, reversely fed by the, the the urban China and also by urbanization process. So uh, let's take a closer look at this uh, this new era. There has been this shift of development paradigms. Adventure slide. Adventure slide. Adventure oh. slide. Okay. Can you see it? No. Nope. No. Nope. Let's click the slide number four. No. 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 Oh, now it's uh, okay. Oh, that's maybe maybe I just use this model. You... Okay. Now you can see now, it, right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so 
Anyway, in this new river, there's, there has been a shift of development paradigms, and uh, the symbolizations of this uh, is it, about the shifting urban-rural relations. And there are many uh, symbolizations of this. Uh, the, the importance of the rural economy has been on the rise. So, so first of all, there are some uh, policy measures like the abolishment of agriculture taxes in the early 21st century. So this is very important. It means, you know, uh, agriculture, rural areas doesn't need to support organization, doesn't need to support the cities. And then we have this kind of uh, improvements in various of uh, rural public service and social securities, uh, uh, minimum living allowance, education, uh, um, the, the pension system, and the new rural cooperative uh, uh, for, for the healthcare. And also then we have this uh, giant national strategies of fight against extreme poverty and, and the rural revitalization strategy started in 2017. So in this process, it means that there has been a shifting value uh, of the rural China. Because I just mentioned that there has been a falling number of peasants in China and also agriculture GDP share has been ha has also fall, fallen under 10%. So the relative importance of agriculture has been uh, ha has dropped. Uh, uh, however, the, the in the same time, um, there has been rising problems of urbanization. So the urban people, the city people, they, they, they want to go to uh, rural areas. They want to go to those uh, sparsely populated areas. They, they, they want to seek uh, rusticity, uh, rurality in rural areas. So it means that there's a rising scarcity of the rurality. And also this kind of uh, phenomenon has been nurtured by this new rural bias. So, so uh, by rural bias, I mean um, people, they think, you know, the rural areas is good, the smallholder, their life is simple and good. We should uh, advocate this kind of uh, style of living and working. So this kind of uh, new rural bias has been partially nurtured by the populism, uh, uh, the, the trend in China. So it's very interesting. So it means the the importance of the rural uh, culture, the value has been on the rise. Uh, so, so here I want to give you a specific example, a case that the China Agriculture University has been uh, cooperating with the local government on uh, experimenting the the rural revitalization strategy. So, so this is a case in the uh, southwestern China. In, it is a village called Mai Di Chong Village in the Kunming City, uh, in the Yunnan Province. So this village is uh, very close to the, the Kunming. So Kunming is a very big uh, metropolitan city. It's 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 very modern, and uh, this village is close to the city. And then we can see in the picture that these are before and these are now. So now it has we has turned uh, we have turned it into uh, turned it into uh, Airbnb style uh, houses. It has four uh four bedrooms there and it has uh kitchens uh, uh the, the 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 dining room uh and also uh, each room has a bathroom with it so but before it is you can see that it's it's used for raising pigs and also this tall house is used for uh drying tobaccos because you know peasants they grow tobaccos in that areas, but but then these houses went, you know, idle, went wasted. Nobody use it anymore because now they don't grow that, uh, they don't use that. So this kind of you know assets of the village. So we want to turn this this is idle assets uh, uh, into into use. Then we turn it into uh, this kind of Airbnb uh, service. So a brief glimpse at the village. Uh, uh, one thing about agriculture is this is the this is a paddy field. So we can see that it has some beautiful patterns on it um, because they use the the colored rice. Uh, otherwise, it's just a very usual, very common uh, paddy uh, paddy rice field. So it would only generate some agricultural output. That's that's not very uh, that's not very good uh, profits. So they turn it into colored paddy field. Then it. Then it became a tourist uh, tourist 
a resort, tourist scenery, then it attracts people to come. So by this process, uh, we added, uh, this is a kind of a value addition process. But however, although we we have this kind of uh, tourism resort, tourism scenery, sports, uh, we, we we need to have some other businesses to to make money so that you know the tourists they came here they 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 enjoy the business they enjoy service they can you know contribute to the rural economy uh, of this village uh so that's this uh, fish catching fish catching festivals uh in this village so it also try to attract more people to come here and then this kind of uh, airbnb service they can make money uh for the rural economy for the village and then we designed various kinds of uh, new industries in the village. Uh, namely, we have four types of uh, rural business here. So this is the uh, restaurants. So the villagers, they, they operate the restaurants. It, it, this can generate income. And then we also help them turn, uh, turn an old house into a meeting room. Uh, three stores. So it can host meetings here. The meeting room generate money. And we also have this, ca uh, this, this cafe and this book bar so people can, you know, they buy a cup of coffee and they leave the money here. And finally, it's this uh, Airbnb room inside. So we can see that it's very modern. It's very comfortable. And outside, it's the, the village, village environment. So this is our team. Uh, this is a launch event when we jointly, uh, you know, uh, announced that this uh, rural business has been uh, has been started started to you know uh, started to make money, and uh, the progress in this past two years uh, when the business started to operate, uh, this business has generated a total of uh, seven hundred and forty thousand yuan in two years. That's not much, but however, for a small village, it's it's a lot. It means that the village collective, they started to 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 earn money, so it has money and it can uh, pay the the villagers at their uh, employees. So it is very important. And in this process, uh, these villagers, they you know they 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 input their own money. So to to establish a shareholder company of this village, and then they hire a local CEO to run this business. So there are many policy innovations in this process. So generally, these new concepts for this practice is that we name it the the Kunming experiment. It's an urban driven rural revitalization process. So it means that. Uh, we seek answers uh, to to resolve the rural problems outside the rural instead of inside the rural areas because urbanization is still very important. Uh, we need to draw the you know the uh, the driving force from the from the urban cities uh, to develop the rural areas because the tourists are coming from the uh, cities and also those uh, uh, investments also some investment are coming from the city city areas so that's why we 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 mean that it's a urban driven rural revitalization so it's about these uh, driving forces and, and also we have uh, explored. Uh, this framework for this kind of uh, new rural uh, construction. So namely, it's one principle, uh, one goal, one ultimate goal is that it's peasant-centered. It means everything should be pro the development of the peasants, their benefits. And then we have these four main bodies. It means that uh, the villagers themselves, the peasants themselves, they are the main body of the decision-making process. They are the main body of the construction process. They are the main body of the management and business operation process. And also, finally, they are the main body of uh, uh, benefiting from this whole economic development process. It's very interesting that I mentioned that uh, 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 there are also four mechanisms in this process. It's very important that first, because in China, the village is collectively owned. So we need to have a rural collective uh, to, to run and operate the, the rural collective assets. Like what I said, the uh, 
there's some 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 collective land or collective houses in in the village that are idle. So we turn those idle assets into the uh, you know live assets of the village, so it can generate income. And then we also uh, we also we also take the input from the government because government has input a lot of money uh, into the village, like building the roads or renovating the houses. So this kind of uh, input has been quantified as the uh, village collective assets. So then these assets in, is in the hands of the village collective. Then this, this money can be used for, you know, investment, renovation of the village, those, those idle assets, so it can operate and generate income. So this is very important. And then the second mechanism is the work for food, labor input compensation. It means that in this whole process, for like, uh, for example, the, the house renovation, so uh, the, the, the rural villages, they themselves, they did the work, they built a house, renovate a house, so, and they got compensated in this process. Um, so this is kind of policy innovation because in the past, we always use the uh, tender, the bid and tender system. You, you know, we we uh, attract some companies to do it. Then we pay the company. But now we think we should pay the we should pay the villages themselves. They can benefit from this construction process. Dr. And then Xu, we, we do need to wrap up uh, in about a minute. Okay. Okay. Then third, uh, when we have this kind of new business, we still have someone to operate, to manage this business. But, you know, rural areas, nobody wants to come, especially young people, they don't want to come. So we so we try to establish this village CEO system to, to, to pay, uh, give a very good payment for the village CEO. Then they can run the business for the village. And finally, it's a profits allocation mechanism among villagers, village collective, and, and the outside investors. The main principle is that the village uh, collective and the villagers themselves, they take the, the bulk of the, the profits in this whole process. So anyway, this is my, my sharing. So kind of uh, different experience from China's rural, uh, rural construction process is, is that our process is a managed social change. It's, it's a very strong uh, government intervention, not like in the West, in the United States. It's uh, That was quite of a, a spontaneous transformation process. Uh, but anyway, there were problems arise in our process, and there were also experiences uh, that we have come up in this process. Uh, okay, I'd like to, to to I look forward to discussing with you uh, later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zhu. Um, just to let you know, all of you, um, to collectively, are, we are on time from the terms of when we started this session. Um, we now should finish in at half past the hour, but we have time for the participants to ask questions of each other. And if you don't, I'll, I'll ask my own questions. So among the four participants, uh, do any one of you have questions for the others? And if you can raise your hand, that might help me. Except for Jason, I don't see your hand. So here we go. Okay, so I'm not hearing um, a lot of, this, of questions coming from each of you. So let me ask a, a general question. All four presenters are professors. Um, I mean, uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, a deep faculty, Chinese, Ag Chinese um, Agricultural University is you know, renowned globally. Um, and then we have uh, three of us who are in the, in the land grant system in the US. Tell me or exchange among your, yourselves how these how professors and how universities can collaborate on issues such as poverty elimination, uneven economic and social development, and not only have this discussion uh, between the US and China, similar to the Sino-US Alliance for University-Based Extension, but also how could we work together globally as global citizens? I am happy to kick it off. Um, the one thing that I saw the thread through all the presentations was investment in local and building the capacity of the citizens to meet their own needs. As we look at opportunities for a global approach 
it really has to become a local approach to addressing global problems, global challenges. And in so doing, we enable, we create opportunity. Uh, and that happens as we translate the research in our universities into practical application in the community-based setting. That's what we do in the land-grant system in the United States, um, it, particularly in cooperative extension. But I know my colleagues uh, in the People's Republic also practice that, uh, as been demonstrated in, in, the, in the two previous, uh, in, in their presentations as well. So to me, that is the most seamless way of promoting uh, viable human development as well as regional, local, regional, and uh, national and international development is by building the capacity of all of our residents to meet their own needs, wherever that may be, because that's contextual, cultural, social, economic, political. Those factors uh, can be uh, uh, addressed as we build the capacity of our citizenry. Okay. We got at least five minutes. Okay. Who else would like to contribute? Okay, let me say something, uh, because uh, I can start from China Agricultural University's experience, uh, as just mentioned by uh, as just mentioned uh, by the professor in the United States, that we we do research and then we translate those research findings into practice. But uh, I want to add another thing in our. Uh, in our practice, we, we also do some piloting programs in rural areas. That's very comprehensive piloting pro programs in uh, developing the rural areas, promoting rural development. However, it's usually uh, in the beginning process, it's usually on a very small uh, areas. So it means it's a demonstration, small demonstration program. So it means that if it failed, then it accumulates experiences. If it, succeed, uh, if it is successful, then we can provide uh, further experience for the next step or for scaling up this experience. That's also what I mentioned in, in, in my case in the Yunnan province actually now we have uh, we have uh, we have been, uh, more than 30 villages have ongoing uh, experiments in rural development and and uh, different villages are having different models uh, of experiments for example in Yunnan it's uh, urban driven uh, 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 rural revitalization but in other places uh, it may be uh, how to connect the smallholder farmers with the big market. In other places, it may be how to connect poverty reduction with rural revitalization. So it depends on the uh, on the local context, the local, uh, not only econom economic context, but also social context. It's very important. So that's our experience. Thank you. Jason, Dr. Henderson. So I think... Um, one thing that I took away was in, in both uh, countries, looking at evolving our rural communities from beyond commodity agricultural type of production and to moving it to, toward more value added and high um, profit or higher profit um, enterprises, thinking about agriculture and tourism. Um, in the United States, we're thinking about doing agriculture and carbon markets um, of doing things for environmental sustainability. And, and so how can you get and receive uh, two profit centers out of one form of production in different ways. And that's kind of some of the things are leveraging different types of economic activity in, in, in addition to agriculture. So I think that was something as we think about rural development in both countries that both are looking at and thinking about uh, from a commodity to a value added uh, types of production systems as economic opportunities and drivers. Any other comments? If not, um, we are at we're very close to the end of time for the rural development segment. I want to thank all four of our presenters. Um, these are you, you, you are wonderful in your presentations. You're on time, which I very much appreciate it because we didn't start on time with the session. So I want to thank you. And I hope in the future that the Chinese agricultural universities, along with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, both the Institute for Sociology and the Institute for rural development can find ways of deepening collaboration that started in 2017. And I hope that that's in our future. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Min for the next part of the webinar.